Good afternoon and welcome. Happy St. Patrick's Day to everybody. Uh, my name is Steve Jewell. I'm with Community Giving and we are delighted to have you join us uh, for today's webinar on placemaking. And uh, we are excited about what we have in store for you today. The people and panelists that have um, joined us to just share stories about what they see working in their communities and um, what we have discovered um, before COVID, we had not done one webinar and the one good thing to come out of COVID was uh, teaching us how to communicate and connect with people across um, the region. And uh, we thought uh, it's still important to keep that going and to talk about pertinent topics and uh, learn from one another. And today's uh, topic is no different on placemaking. And so what is placemaking? Well, placemaking really is connecting people to place and giving people that inspiration and, and pride and connectedness to the places that they call home. And it's in a, uh, often in a geography in which, in which we share. It, it gives us that excitement and, um, and belief that we belong and that we're a part of something. And so uh, I think it's been fun over the years to discover um, different ways uh, communities uh, celebrate place and uh, connect each other to place. And we feel at Community Giving that the community foundations play a very important role in that as partners with all of, uh, all of you who are on the call, whether it's a nonprofit or whether it's government, we all share uh, these, these uh, geographic areas in place and working together, we can make them the best that they can be. So thank you so much for joining. If you have questions as we go, please put them in the Q&A tab and we will get to uh, questions uh, and answers. We are gonna have two different panels present today. Um, the first is gonna talk about the importance of placemaking. And then we're gonna hear from uh, those who are our, our practitioners and people who are actually uh, sharing examples of wonderful um, placemaking that's taking place all over Minnesota. So uh, with that, um, we really appreciate you joining us today, and uh, we'll look forward to uh, your comments and feedback at the end. Always, we appreciate that input as well. So without uh, any further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Greta Stark Crocker, who's the Executive Director of the Central Minnesota Community Foundation to introduce our first panel. Thanks, Steve. We're pleased to have Jennifer Penns Culver with the St. Cloud Arts Commission. She's been the Arts Commission Coordinator with St. Cloud for over 20 years. In that time, she has implemented 42 public art installations, managed, managed three gallery spaces, completed a 10-year community culture plan, facilitated the Community Artworks Initiative, and partnered with the Planning Commission on the City of St. Cloud Placemaking Plan and Design Manual. We're also very pleased to have Heather Allen, Program Officer of the Central Minnesota Arts Board. She's a teaching artist and community organizer by heart and by practice. As the program officer, her work focuses on developing and delivering grant programs and learning opportunities that serve artists, create organizations, and regional residents at large. She has practiced and taught a variety of visual arts mediums and currently creates work in acrylic paint on plywood. As an organizer, she facilitates conversations about equity, inclusion, social justice, anti-racism, and the intersection of race and the arts. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Jennifer and Heather. Good morning, everyone. I, I was able to unmute successfully. Hooray. Um, I'm going to be sharing my screen here with our lovely placemaking presentation. There we go. So this is my, my favorite um, picture of true community engagement and creative place making. It, it is um, the Lake George Park. Um, and it is uh, an aerial shot of Summertime by George, which is a uh, summer festival that takes place in St. Cloud about mm, 12 times throughout the summer and brings on average about 12,000 community members into the park. Um, I think what makes creative placemaking successful like this is that it should be inclusive, it should be a community-led process, um, and the use of the space should reflect those who will be using it and how they're going to use it. And that's truly reflected not only in this 
particular event that occurs in St. Cloud, but also throughout the year at Lake George. Um, we were fortunate enough to have a wonderful community partner in the St. Cloud Rotary who really dug in and renovated this entire park um, and made it much more vibrant public space than it had previously been. So again, community led, inclusive, placemaking is an ongoing process. It never stops. It is constantly evaluation, testing, reevaluation, testing, watching, seeing what happens and that the scale should follow the site. So obviously an event like Summer 10 by George, which features, you know, up to 10 to 12,000 people is a great fit for something like a park as large as Lake George Park. But I think community placemaking can also be wonderful on a smaller scale as well. Um, and you can see this, this was just a small component of Summertime by George, a small little side project that um, we brought in called the Seat Suite, which included all of these large scale looking seats that were actually very light. Um, they were made by a wonderful group um, out of, and of course my memory is completely failing me now, but anyway. So the economic impact of the arts I feel are strong as far as keeping our funding local. Um, it's, it includes a lot of secondary spending, whether you have an event and people go out to eat or need a babysitter or pay for parking, you know, in addition to that. Um, our most recent economic impact study showed that the nonprofit arts, arts sector in St. Cloud generated about $9.8 million annually for our local community. Um, obviously, that's been affected by COVID. So, uh, you know, it'll be interesting to see what our new um, economic impact figures will look like. Um, as far as community engagement, I think it's wonderful how placemaking can bring together um, a lot of different communities, but it's usually centered in a particular place. So the community that uses that place is obviously going to be the main um, target that you want to work with. I think it's a great opportunity for our community members to self-identify and determine what it is that they would like to see in their community and bringing new voices to that table. Oftentimes we work very top down and the best part about community placemaking and creative placemaking is that it is a grassroots bottom up approach. And it includes a lot of active participation whether through planning, implementation and ongoing programming. Um, again, I talked about examples, large examples, small examples. Um, one of my favorite examples is actually not in St. Cloud, it is regarding how you can really foster some great community engagement through the arts. And that was through uh, the city of St. Paul's artist in residence program with their artist, Amanda Lovely, who had created a pop-up meeting vehicle. Basically she went out into neighborhoods to survey people and ask them that what they would like to see in their neighborhoods based upon what the city departments needed from her. And it increased the participation that residents had in city government, 89%. So the vast majority of the residents were not connecting with their city government, but through this program, it gave them an opportunity to, gave them a voice at the table, gave them you know, active input into what they would see in their communities. So that was just stunning. And I would love to copy that by all means in our community. Um, Again, I talked about small and large scale. I mean, obviously the large scale with Lake George, great example, but I think the more intimate small scale projects that you see here, whether they're little parklets, um, another organization that I just find incredible for their examples of creative placemaking is an organization called Big Car Collective out of Indianapolis. They do a lot of that in their community, as well as you see the little pop-up mini library, which is something that we're hoping to implement as we've moved into our new city hall facility, which is the old tech high school facility. Um, and so those are things that we're looking to implement based upon the scale of the space that we are going to be using. So essentially, 
exit out of our slideshow. Hello, everyone again. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the opportunity for artists to get involved um, and work with community members is one of the most valuable components of creative placemaking. It really helps bring to life what the community would like to see and the artists add that amazing bit of creativity um, to really implement those, those ideas and designs and bring community forward, whether it's visual art, literary art, or performing art. Um, I think they're all integral components of creative placemaking and, and just make it that much better for our community to have vibrant public spaces. And I'd be happy to take any questions. I saw somebody had to take a, a put up a question of regarding the organization. Um, I'm with the City of St. Cloud with the St. Cloud Arts Commission. The organization is two that I had mentioned that I think are phenomenal. Um, the City of St. Paul and their Artist Residence Program, an organization out of Indianapolis called Big Cart Collective. Um, I'd also include Forecast Public Art out of the Twin Cities. They've been an amazing facilitator and implementer of um, public art and creative placemaking. Um, obviously, I'm an arts advocate, so I try to make sure that that is all included in what we do at the City of St. Cloud. Um, but again, we're a recommending body, so sometimes those recommendations are taken and sometimes they are not, but we are always here advocating for that inclusion, that community building, and those other components that make placemaking such a valuable part of our community. And I still, I still have some time to go. Uh, <laughs> so I'll just talk about our most recent acquisition for the city is that we have now moved into what was a 102 year old high school. Um, we are going to be having a, a space. I'm actually looking out my window right now at what is Lake George and seeing activity throughout there, even though it's still a little snowy and wet. But um, we're going to be right across the street from that, and we're looking at implementing placemaking on our lawn space. And we're looking at it in a more intimate setting. So where Summer Time by George would bring a large um, musical act in and draw a large, large crowd, we're looking at things that are smaller, poetry readings, um, acoustics, uh, acoustic guitar and um, folk music sets, chamber music sets. The little library, our library is right across the street, so we're lucky enough to partner with them to have them bring over um, just a portable library that people can see during the day. Or if you know, if you want to read outside, we have that available to you. In addition to that, we work with an organization called the Yes Network, which provides uh, lunches throughout the summer as well as arts programming throughout the summer. So doing some of that arts programming, pro programming out here on the lawn is another thing that we're looking to do. And, Hopefully we will get the grant funding we have requested for bringing all of those things to life and looking forward to working with our community artists and more ideas in addition to the Lake George Neighborhood Association, which um, I'm a part of as a person who lives in the Lake George neighborhood, bringing those folks together in our community to make sure that they all have a say on what happens in their spaces, their public spaces. Um, so yeah, those are really exciting things on the horizon. And again, I would emphasize not all placemaking has to be multi-million dollar projects like our Lake George um, renovation, which thankfully we had a fabulous partner in the St. Cloud Rotary. I think many, many, many opportunities can happen on a very small and intimate scale and be very impactful in our communities. Um, even something as small as putting little plastic cups into a chain link fence that were, was a project that we did many years ago. Um, your next speaker, Heather Allen, was one of the artists on that project and it is still standing. It serves as a wonderful gateway to the Seaburger Roosevelt neighborhood. Um, and I believe it was done well over 13 years ago. Still looks pretty great. Still very colorful, still reflects the community's input and activity in bringing that small mural to life. Thank you, Jennifer. So, thank you. Um, I think we're going to transition into our next panelist. Thanks, Jennifer, for your input and insight. That was wonderful. I'll turn it over to Heather. Thanks, Greta. What a perfect way to be queued up. 
Jennifer, I, I drive past that um, fence on Third Street and after all these years now, I don't have to see anything and my kids go, yes, we know. We know you helped make that, we know. <laughs> so, um, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Heather Allen and uh, as you heard with the, Greta's kind introduction earlier, I am the program officer for the Central Minnesota Arts Board. We are one of Minnesota's 11 regional arts councils. The four counties that we serve at CMAB are Benton, Sherburn, Stearns, and Wright County. And this panel is really well curated because um, Jennifer's talk is a perfect introduction to the large metro area that we serve in our four counties, which is St. Cloud, um, and then some other counties going um, down southeast towards the metro. I come at uh, creative placemaking uh, first, as an artist, um, I was a teaching artist before I was involved in grants administration with the CMAB, where I've been for 10 years. Um, and, and the conversations I'm most often involved in around placemaking focus specifically on public art. And that can look like a lot of different things. I always like to share when I talk about public art, um, a line I heard, I think, from a forecast public art employee years ago about good public art really extending beyond the three M's, which are murals, monuments, and memorials. And monuments and memorials are kind of the same thing, aren't they? <laughs> so now we're down to two. Um, and those things are great, right? Like we, we don't wanna get rid of murals, monuments, and memorials, but the, the argument for creative placemaking that really deepens the meaning and the power of what public art can be is that good public art, good creative placemaking is connected to communities, right? Those ideas spring up from maybe a couple creative neighbors, um, maybe an artist trying to solve a problem or address a, a group of folks who have expressed that they don't feel safe in an area. Um, and so for me as an artist and as a grant maker, I get really excited when those things, the creative problem solving, the ability to make spaces feel exciting and be memorable can intersect with the ability to problem solve or, or move a group forward. And in the work I do with CMAB, I'm lucky to see a lot of examples of that. I have some slides I'm going to show you. Um, and as I pull that up, I'm gonna to respond to another bullet point we were offered to respond to, um, which is the idea of, of creative placemaking and economic development, right? Because we're always talking about um, how the arts circle back to economic development. I become uh, a little less interested in that particular piece because I think um, what's magical and, excuse me, I have to find where it says full screen, here we go. So what's magical about the arts, about good public art, um, is that it creates the conditions that enable communities to thrive. And that connects to economic prosperity and development. Um, public art makes places, like I mentioned before, memorable. It makes, uh, I heard a, um, the executive director of Minnesota Citizens for the Arts yesterday giving an example of um, a doctor who's been offered a position, perhaps up in St. Cloud at Centric Care and another position down in the Twin Cities and is saying like, why would I, what, what's my reason to consider this community versus another community? Um, and oftentimes those decisions for people who are choosing where to make a home have a lot to do with how a community feels, what you see when you drive through, um, what, what the parks look like versus what another park looks like. Um, and, and that's just the beginning of what those sorts of activities and opportunities can mean for communities. So I have a few examples of projects that we through the Central Minnesota Arts Board have been fortunate to fund over the years. And I'm just gonna show them to you and talk a little bit about each of them. Um, and we'll, we'll come across some more of those intersections between public art and placemaking and um, economic growth to within communities. So the first uh, image that I have on the screen here, we're not in full screen, are we? Okay. Comes from uh, Buffalo, Minnesota. Buffalo, man, maybe five or six years ago, received a grant from the Central Minnesota Arts Board through our public art program uh, to purchase and install these uh, large scale outdoor musical instruments 
to be installed around a bike trail that circles Buffalo Lake, which is kind of the, the jewel of the city where all of their commerce and things are connected. This project was also strongly supported by the Rotary, if I'm not mistaken, Jennifer, uh, different Rotary down in Buffalo, um, but a, a great example of what can happen when community groups feel strongly about initiatives and then partner with um, civic organizations to make things happen. So uh, with funds from public art, they were able to purchase somewhere between five and seven different large scale um, outdoor musical instruments. They have these, you might see in the pictures, these mallets that are attached with cords that can be played. Um, with the way sound carries on the lake, they're kind of especially haunting and magical on the right day. And one of our favorite um, stories that we tell associated with projects relates back to this particular project. In the final report, <clears throat> one of the applicants mentioned that um, a friend who's a PCA had told her that this park had become really important to one of her clients. And one of the challenges with her client was getting him to exercise, getting him out and active. And um, after these instruments were installed, he became so enthralled with visiting the chimes and the different things, um, his walk became no problem anymore. He wanted to go out and visit the instruments, take a walk around the lake. Um, and just like Jennifer was saying, you know, making reasons for people to come out into community is part of where the power of public art goes beyond being something cool to see or visit um, and really can transform the way, you know, somebody's quality of life looks. Another example, uh, just down the road from Buffalo is a developing public art uh, project in Delano, Minnesota. Uh, the sculpture walk exists right off the highway. There's a really nicely uh, crafted map that you can see on the example here. And this is an example of some kind of long-term strategic economic development that the city has been investing in um, to really over time change what, what it feels like to live in a city. Delano is not a big city, um, and something I like to say about some of the smaller communities we have that really embrace the arts is they have an advantage because it takes less time to develop a critical mass. So if your community has a smaller footprint and all of a sudden you have a rather large sculpture walk, that's a big part of your community now. Another small community that's really leading the charge in um, what it means to see a, a city transformed by really embracing the arts um, and, and making it part of, really part of government um, is Monticello. And next to St. Cloud uh, within our region, Monticello is maybe the only city I can think of that has embraced the arts as part of, part of what the city does. So about five years ago, um, the city, dedicated some funds to uh, hire a contractor who herself is a, um, a metal sculptor to lead public art initiatives. And I'm like getting goosebumps when I think of Monticello because of, of the four counties that we serve, we've seen such rapid growth in this community in the last four or five years. And it has an awful lot to do with the city's support and enthusiasm for this work. Um, I think, let me double check. So the two murals on the top right, and then the two pieces on the left of your screen were all funded through public art proposals, separate public art proposals. Um, two, uh, two of them are from local artists from within the community of Monticello. Two are from Minnesota artists, I believe. I might be mistaken about the bottom left sculpture being a Minnesota artist, but uh, the point is, each of these installations has brought activity around the making of it. Artists visit and students at schools get to learn that artists are real people who have jobs and make things happen and um, you know, can, can stand in front of them as an example of, of what you can pursue yourself. Another really cool example of what happens through public art is the ability for artists to help communities to heal. Um, sometimes after something terrible has happened, the first people we turn to are poets or musicians or authors. Um, 
several years ago, there was a, a terrible and tragic explosion at the Sartell paper mill. And some months after that happened, the decision was made not to open the paper mill again. It was eventually sold and torn down. Um, but, but this structure was iconic and really, really important um, to the economic life of that community. And one thing um, that puts some, uh, I suppose, depth or magic into you know, the tragedy that happened there was the ability um, of a group of artists who were able to salvage some pieces from the demolition site as the paper mill was being torn down and create sculptures, some functional, some just beautiful, um, in some parks across the river from the site of where the paper mill was. Um, and those sculptures are still existing today. The one you see in the bottom right is a bike rack. Um, and then others all have little placards and descriptions about the artists and things. Um, but this was such a, such a beautiful example of artists finding ways to help communities to sort of move past and process um, something really difficult and, and tragic that happened. And then a final example are just some more um, projects and events that have happened around the region. We fund public art specific installations, um, but also things like arts festivals, as Jennifer mentioned with Summertime by George. Um, there was a, a new uh, invention of the, the Millstream Arts Festival, if you're familiar with that act activity that happens in St. Joe last year, um, in partially in response to COVID. Um, and, and because the timing was right, that that event transformed into a night market happening on Monday nights in the summer and it was wildly successful and well attended. Another example that I'll list, I've completely lost track of time, so I'm just waiting any moment to see someone appear on the screen. You're good, Heather. Okay, good, thank you. <laughs> um, another example of a, a, a great way to engage community and also create sort of long lasting um, public art that also um, does something that placemaking likes to do, which is wayfinding, finding creative ways to help people navigate and um, under, you know, locate within a community. On the right side of the screen is a, an image of the Northeast Wilson Park neighborhood gateway. Um, this was a project spearheaded by an artist named Claire Witt. Claire is a mosaic artist and a, a metal welder. Um, and I'm a multimedia artist of, of many stripes. And Claire wanted to engage neighbors from a couple of apartment buildings near where this sign is installed, um, some kids that she worked with, and I believe um, an, another group of folks from a nearby neighborhood to create a, a neighborhood sign. So it's hard to see from this image, but the top part of that sign is a whole bunch of handmade clay tiles made by kids, made by residents of the apartment. Um, and then the bottom portion of the sign is steel that is salvaged, was salvaged from the nearby um, recycling, uh, steel recycling plant that's really just a couple blocks from that part of town. If you're not familiar with St. Cloud, the northeast side is the industrial portion of the city. It's where um, east side glass used to be and um, the metal recycling places. This artist referred to it as the big shoulders of St. Cloud. And she really wanted to sort of acknowledge that. So that's why um, that piece of uh, laser cut steel that sits behind the words on the fences is a part of that. So the folks who got to take part in making that sign whenever they pass by get to remember um, how they really are truly part of the community where they're living because their hands are right there on the sign. I think, oops, I think those are all the slides that I have for you. Oh, of course, how could I forget? <laughs> so the Central Minnesota Arts Board office is in Foley, Minnesota. Foley is a small town of about 4,500 people. And um, about two years ago, right before the pandemic began, uh, an economic development group in Foley wanted to make some moves and, and have a piece of public art. This piece that you see that was installed on the side of just a plain um, corrugated steel sided building 
was the result of a community engagement project where art, uh, I think it was four artists were invited to submit designs, to share them at the public library and through some city events in the summer. Those, um, those designs were able to be voted on by community members. And then the artist who received the most votes was commissioned um, in part with funds from the Central Minnesota Arts Board uh, to create this beautiful installation that, that literally transforms how the small main street in downtown Foley feels and looks. And that is the last of the slides I have to share with you. I will check the chat. We'll come to questions at the end, if you don't mind, Heather. Happy to. Great. So thank you so much, Jennifer and Heather. That was wonderful. Heather, you bring back many fond memories of my work at a, another foundation I worked at in central Minnesota. And uh, you reminded me of, I was trying to remember the artist's name, the mosaic artist. And so thanks for uh, bringing that up. So appreciate that. So uh, welcome everyone. Uh, glad to have you here Saint Patrick, uh, for St. Saint Saint Patrick's Day. Um, I want to thank all of our panelists for sharing your time and, and expertise and information with us. Uh, we appreciate your giving your time and to all of you for attending and uh, being willing to learn and hopefully bring back some uh, great ideas to implement in your communities. Just a quick reminder that uh, you can place your questions in the Q&A or the chat options on the toolbar at the bottom and uh, Sarah will uh, guide us through some of those questions after all the panelists have spoken. Um, before I introduce the next panelist, I just want to remind people, if you uh, haven't seen it, um, we had Dr. Catherine Laughlin uh, come on. She's kind of known as the placemaking uh, expert in the country. Um, she works out of North Carolina. She previously was with the Knight Foundation and led the Soul of the Community uh, Project for them. And uh, through that study of 26 communities around the country, um, they identified three things that made communities uh, the place that people love and want to stay and invite other people to come and uh, resulting in, in the economic growth that Heather talked about is one of the strategies. So um, uh, what Dr. Laughlin found in all 26 communities were three common things. One, that there was a sense of open, openness and welcome, welcoming to the community. Uh, second was aesthetics. Um, so this fits perfectly with that. And finally, gathering places and events also, which also kind of encompasses what we're talking about today with, with using the arts. So um, we really want to uh, recognize that. Um, I just want to share another story, what I was trying to remember, Claire Witt's name. Uh, I was working with Long Prairie, uh, AJ, one of my coworkers' hometown, uh, and Claire Witt came in and did a mosaic project in their park. They called it Unity Park. And uh, they brought together the Latinx residents um, with their Caucasian residents. And together they built mosaics on their fountains in the park and uh, park benches and uh, use it as a way to come together. <clears throat> and also in Long Prairie, one of the goals they wanted to do is become a tourist destination. So I have to say when they picked that as one of their community goals, I had to take a little bit of a gulp uh, and I uh, was thinking, okay, how are they going to do this? Uh, well, they created like a three or four story mural uh, in town of, uh, for, it's part of their World War II memorial. And they literally have tour buses now coming in from all over, stopping in Long Prairie to see that uh, memorial and that mural and uh, stopping and having lunch at the restaurants and things like that. Uh, so it was just one of those great examples uh, of what can happen in communities using art. So now I want to, uh, I have the good fortune of introducing four folks who are going to talk about their communities and uh, how they've used the arts for placemaking. So in order of presenting, first we have Cara Maloney. Cara is the executive director of the Lanesboro Arts, who oversees all strategic planning and development activity. She also drives the organization's broader educational and community engagement efforts. Cara brings strong leadership, organizational continuity, positive energy, and new ideas to Lanesboro art roles she's held since 2016. As a board member of the Lanesboro Chamber of Commerce and Southeast Minnesota Arts Council, Cara's dedication to local efforts runs deep. Her experience in cross-sector partnerships, innovative art programs, and leadership roles has ensured ongoing programmatic excellence 
up for the organization and from the organization. Um, CAR has also taken place in numerous leadership uh, programs through Blandon, Springboard for the Arts, Bush Foundation, and Propel um, nonprofits. So uh, welcome, Cara. Thank you. Uh, next, we'll have Matt Wooderman. Matt is a husband, dad, neighbor, and Carver County Commissioner. Um, you Matter is his key message, supported by Pillars of People Matter, uh, Community Matters, and Finance Matters in word, dialogue, and action. Matt was born in Iowa, moved to New York, came back to Iowa, and then moved to Minnesota, where he met and married his wife and had uh, their children. His efforts are focused on family and making Carver County an even better community and generational destination to live, work, and play. Uh, his three top traits are authenticity, curiosity, and efficient outcomes. Welcome, Matt. Look forward to hearing your uh, talk. Next, we have Kristen Allen. Kristen served as the artistic director for the River Space Project in New London, an Art Place America Creative Plant Placemaking Grant. And she's also a serial community muralist and always looking for ways to engage regular folks with the process of art making. Uh, she teaches drawing and painting to adults every Monday and Tuesday evening from her garage using the hybrid Zoom in the Room model. Look forward to hearing about that. And finally, we'll have Michelle Anderson. And I heard Michelle a number of years ago uh, talk about their work in Fergus Falls, and uh, I remembered it. So it had an impact on me, Michelle. So uh, Michelle is a Rural Program Director for Springboard for the Arts, a community and economic development organization for artists based in Minnesota. Michelle has launched nationally recognized rural programs at the intersection of the arts, historic preservation, health and economic development. Her writing and ideas on dismantling stereotypes of rural life have been featured in um, min, min, mnartists.org, the New York Times, and more. Michelle is also a pianist and creative writer and lives in Fergus Falls with her husband, Spencer, and their three-year-old son. So, oh, Michelle, you're the one that uh, was, uh, had the New York Times uh, thing going. So, welcome. Great to have you here, all of you. Thank you. And uh, go ahead, Cara. Thank you, Carl, for that introduction. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and I'm excited to be on this panel with Michelle and Kristen and Matt. There's nothing better than to um, learn from each other in this virtual way, especially when we're spread all across the state. Um, I'm going to share my screen here. Um, Carl asked today if I would talk about um, art in Lanesboro and also the bike trail. So I'll start with a kind of brief history, um, but talk about um, Lanesboro, which is in the southeastern region of the state. Um, I'll share how the Lanesboro community has been using placemaking practices for decades, which has led to the sustainability of our town with a population of only 750 people. And I'll also share with you how Lanesboro Arts's role um, in continuing the placemaking efforts in our community today. So for those of you who have not visited Lanesboro before, um, here's a little brief description. Um, Lanesboro is located in the Driftless region of Minnesota. Um, it's an agricultural community, a valley with bluffs on all sides. Um, in 1869, there was a train track that was built running trains from other small towns to Lanesboro. Um, and that train track was later connected with bigger communities, including the cities and Chicago um, and across the US. The town was founded in 1869 and quickly thereafter, there was um, historic buildings that were built that are still um, in our community today. Um, there are houses that were built at that time in a Victorian style, um, which are very decorative and that are now bed and breakfasts that um, are used for lodging for visitors. Um, and there's a river that runs through our town um, that's used for, um, that was used for milling, but is now used for recreation. Um, when you think about Lanesboro today, um, we think about a vibrant small community, but um, how did it get to this point? Uh, I hear stories from living in Lanesboro for the past six years about um, the 60s and 70s in Lanesboro and how people talked about that it was a really beautiful community, but there's a lot of vacant storefronts and there was a lack of 
um, energy and vibrancy that we have today. One of the main things that contributed to that change was the transition of the railroad um, into a bike trail. So in 1978, the train stopped coming to town um, and they actually vacated the route. And the Minnesota Department of National Resources did a feasibility study. And although there was a lot of controversy in our community with about two thirds of the landowners um, and farmers that had the train originally going through their town, not wanting a bike trail going through, um, the community led a lot of informational meetings with the um, Department of National Resources and um, community members and landowners that finally led to the construction of the Root River State Trail in 1989. So here's some pictures of what that trail looks like today. Um, I think that the transition from rail to trail, um, it was one of the first in the state and it demonstrates um, kind of placemaking efforts from the beginning of just um, a challenge that was going on in our community with a vacant railroad trail and how um, it was identified as an opportunity and how the community came together to find solutions using um, local resources. And now they turn something that wasn't um, being productive in the community to a beautiful resource that's used today. Um, around that same time in the um, late 80s, early 90s, there was a group of local artists that um, were starting their own gallery. And there was also a group of theater and performing artists who um, were taking a historic movie theater and were using it for performing arts. Um, so that energy is really what brings me to the conversation today to talk to you about Lanesboro Arts work um, and what we're doing with placemaking initiatives. Um, Lanesboro Arts is um, the result of the merger between um, two arts organizations that started in those the late 80s, early 90s with that rich history of community building um, through the arts. Lanesboro Arts is a multidisciplinary arts organization using arts to solve innovative, um, using arts to solve community challenges with innovative solutions. Um, we use diverse programming throughout the town through um, visual arts galleries, performing arts um, at our theater that we still own today, artist residency programs, public art initiatives, and educational outreach. Lanesboro Arts is shifting the lens from what an art center is as an art center in one building to the role it can play throughout the community in cultural and economic sustainability. Through key partnerships with the city of Lanesboro and the Lanesboro Area Chamber of Commerce, we're able to lead the Lanesboro Arts Campus, which is a model for community development that integrates art into the fabric and infrastructure of the community. In 2014, the city of Lanesboro passed a resolution declaring the entire town of Lanesboro as an arts campus, which was one of the first rural towns in America to make such a declaration. Um, you can see in these images how, um, in a small version of how that plays out, um, we were talking about aesthetics Carl brought up of how that really creates an impactful place. In 2011, we had artist um, Carl Unash, who's a local sculptor who helped us make wayfinding signs that all have unique elements on top that talk about um, there's an eagle's nest, there's a bird, there's an acorn kind of growth in our community. And um, the images on the right are an effort we did in 2018, collaborating with the city to install a new welcome sign into town um, as one of our main entrances that created um, consistency with our um, designs and had that shared aesthetic on shared signs throughout our community that you'll see when you visit town. The Lanesboro Arts Campus is an arts experience that is designed to enhance and connect existing assets 
the river, scenery, recreation, history, and downtown. The Lanesboro Arts Campus approach is inspired by the creative principles of creative placemaking. And that's what we're here to talk about today, which concentrates on arts and culture to enhance community vitality and create a more engaging environment for people to live, work, and visit. Um, the initial phase of the Arts Campus initiatives included the poetry parking lot, which I'll talk about in a little bit, um, artful wayfinding signs that promote walkability, the restoration of both of our buildings, our gallery building and our St. Main Theater, and has continued with momentum through the past few years with some public art initiatives. One that I will highlight here is an artist named Bailey Allen who did a residency. And I think why this was such a success is she took um, a local business and collaborated with the business owners who had vacant or um, boarded up windows. And she was able to um, have community mosaic making events along the bike trail and in front of our gallery. And with the community's help was able to design mosaics and um, install them on those boarded up windows. So now when you walk by them in town, they really seem like they fit in. And it also led the building owners to um, repaint their um, building as well. So it just really looks really sharp and nice. Another example that we did in the past few years was an effort with Good Space Murals, which was um, where we took the back of our St. Main Theater which was a space that looked very uninviting and transformed it into a place that we now have kids education programs and music, music events. Um, and now it's a place that people stop by to take pictures with. Um, we had um, community members come up with design ideas and um, they also were able, we had over like 100 students help paint the mural. So it really is a full process um, from start to finish using, um, involving the community. The Lanesboro Arts Campus has attracted new participants, new ideas and new activities to Lanesboro and has helped create strong and incentive arts and, and civic culture um, collaboration. Recently, we've partnered with the city on shared initiatives that include a new welcome banners, wayfinding signage, community engagement support while creating a comprehensive plan and supporting efforts of Main Street beautification, which I will share um, in a little bit. The Lanesboro Arts Campus uses arts and creative placemaking to um, engage the community and visitors in the arts, stimulate economic growth and improve quality of life, attract and retain visitors and residents to businesses and investment, create spaces for community interaction and construct artful inviting venues for activities and events, expand opportunities for artists to create and display their artwork, build on existing assets and keep Lanesboro authentic and unique. So those are the goals that drive us. Um, to the work that we do today. Um, one of those efforts that we're working on or that you can visit while you're in town, making sure I'm okay on time, um, is the Poetry Parking Lot, which is one of the initiatives that we're known for in Lanesboro, which was um, Lanesboro Arts worked with the city to address limited downtown parking by transforming an underutilized city parking lot into the poetry parking lot. Um, as you know, in small towns, there's only so many parking spots and there was a vacant lot um, that was just down the street that wasn't being used. So they had, um, they invited a renowned poet to lead haiku um, workshops and invited the community to submit haiku submissions. Um, there's over a hundred submissions and there was 15 selected. So now when you come to Lanesboro, you can park in the poetry parking lot and read poems um, written by local residents. Um, so it's a gallery tour of poetry. Um, and that's a way um, to bring people to that space and encourage them to walk into town um, using our um, walking paths. 
a smaller initiative, I know we talked about um, big initiatives and small initiatives, um, is our youth education program in the summer. It's called Surprise Sculpture, and that uses um, creative placemaking um, in a way that kids can understand. So it's for all ages, um, kids gather in our education studio and we used recycle and reused materials to build sculptures together and then install them in places in the community for the community to enjoy. Um, and it's a art activity that kids won't be able to take home, but it's something that they will get to share with the community. So the community will happen upon these um, sculptures and um, be, um, it drives them to look at spaces in different ways. So this initiative increases um, the beauty of overlooked places in our community and also encourages walkability and fosters public interaction. While they're walking around, they can happen upon these um, cool art pieces created by kids and it gets kids thinking in new ways. Um, you can see in that bottom left corner, those were political yard signs that um, we had kids make poetry on. We painted them and they had poems on. And the one, the picture on the right is bike tires um, with ripped bed sheets um, and how those can create vibrant um, installations in our community. An initiative that was started um, in 2014 that continues today is a grassy ball field um, in Lanesboro that now we call Gateway Park, which is um, an entrance to the community. When you park in the poetry parking lot, you'll walk past the space. Um, we had workshops with community members to identify what they would like to see in this space. And a lot of them wanna see live music um, and it being used as an amphitheater space. So um, we took those ideas and we have been doing a summer concert series in the park that was great um, for social distancing in the past few years um, and that we're continuing today to really think about that space that was not being used. And now um, Lanesboro Arts has installed electricity in that space and it has been used for weddings and yoga and workshops with different artists and is just revitalized to this new asset. Um, another way we've used placemaking, Heather talked about as a way to heal in a community. I'll, I'll wrap up soon. <laughs> um, is this gravel lot. And I think that is um, an impactful um, story because there was three buildings that burnt down in Lanesboro about 20 years ago. And Lanesboro Arts identified with the city um, we created almost like a pop-up park. And now that building and land, the landowner is now applying for money to um, really engage that space in ways and hopefully build spaces that we can all use. Um, as rural communities continue to change and revolve, there are opportunities for artists and the creative process to bring people together to address challenges and create a shared vision for um, change. Um, the organization's philosophy at Lanesboro Arts is that the arts, the audience is everyone. In a small town, that means truly knowing the people in your community and embracing the unique identity. Understanding that will help lead to successful placemaking efforts in your community. Thank you, Cara. That was wonderful. And I just have to say how much I enjoyed my visit to Lanesboro a couple of years ago. And one of my favorite small towns in Minnesota, for sure. So, uh, and, and you've helped make it that way. So I appreciate that. And uh, uh, look forward to a visit again. In fact, my neighbor is bringing down uh, the Brainerd Bike Clubs coming down your way for a, a bike outing soon. So uh, thanks for that work. Next up, we have Matt Witterman, uh, Crowing County, or I'm sorry, Carver County uh, Commissioner. So welcome, Matt. Glad to have you here. Thank you. Uh, somebody was going to pop slides. It looks like they're coming up now. Uh, it might be a little bit of a different interlude from what we've heard from the others. Um, I love everything that was said. Jennifer, with your government experience in St. Cloud, we make it there a couple times a year. Um, Heather, a lot of arts-heavy stuff, and a lot of that was resonated. I was jotting down a bunch of ideas. 
And Kara, um, I'm a big biker. We're going to come to Lanesboro. I like the charm of the small town, but I, I took a little bit different view on placemaking, uh, being in, being new to an elected role, uh, especially with an election cycle coming up. There's a lot of people that are passionate about different topics, and you're definitely going to have the art community or the senior community or others that are intentional about placemaking. There's a larger group of people that hear that sometimes and say, that sounds expensive or that's not something that I can do, or where do I plug in or where are the on-ramps? And kind of a personal story for me, when I was in the election cycle, um, being a commissioner or actually leading to, to up to being elected, one of the hot topic items was George Floyd. And so I live in a in a, the city area of Carver County. Uh, one of my peers is in the rural area and, and we, we kind of compare, compared notes as to what was the hot topic item that people were talking about. I wish it was placemaking. I wish it was building of the arts. I wish it was anything other than COVID but it wasn't for him. It was the price of pork and beans. And for me, it was, how do you feel about critical race theory or racism? And uh, I kind of got caught on my heels. I, I, I said, I, I guess the words that came out of my life, my, my mouth were, I love people <laughs> first and foremost, hopefully they're high character people and people that are working for community. But in the midst of all that, there was a lot of darts being thrown my way politically. And so let's move on to the next slide. I had to put it into a context as to why, why are we on this call? Why are there 52 participants that are interested in to hear with what one or more of us have to say? Uh, I think easily framing the question sometimes is not just the passionate, but the next group of folks that could, we could sway into the, the realm of being advocates for placemaking um, or, or be loud um, uh, people in opposition. And so I just simply framed it to say, I want an even better community. I had an opponent that was the um, was the incumbent and somebody said, why, why are you running for this role? And they wanted me to come up with some grandiose thing that was wrong with our community. And I said, are we live in a great community? I just want to make it even better. And I look in the eyes of our two and a half year old and six and a half year old and say, I hope that in 25 years, they get to make the decision if they want to come back here or not. And I want this community to be like that. And so when I'm talking to people, a lot of people want to say, well, how do you feel about diversity, which is, um, it's a lightning rod issue in our community. It can divide more than it can unify. Um, equity, diversity, pronouns, placemaking, other things, those can be lightning rod issues. And I just simply say, aren't you, aren't you invested in wanting an even better community? Our house may be different, but our why is the same. And then from a lens of government, half my brain is finance, half my brain is marketing. And so I can see pie in the sky, everything's possible. And then I also bring it down to the, how do you pay for this stuff? How do you, once you put, put these things in play, it, do we, do we have a plan in 20 years to continue to, 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 to make it viable? And so we're in a unique position in Carver County. We're the fastest growing county in the state at 2.1% a year, three times what the state average is. Um, we're the healthiest, the happiest, the most affluent, the whitest, uh, and all kinds of other things. And I said, we're in a unique position to take it on our shoulders to create a replicable bl blueprint of some of the things that we're doing here to produce a quality of life that other can other people can take a, take a look at and, and maybe bring back to their communities, but ultimately to create a generational destination for why people want to be here. And so Simon Sinek always said, start with why. Uh, we've got a lot of house in Carver County. You're just going to have to come visit because I don't have all those pictures in here. But I'm going to uh, brag a little bit on Carver County, and then we'll get into the four uh, pieces that I'm going to speak on. Um, as I said, that we're the fastest growing county in the state, um, the happiest, the healthiest based on third parties that, that declare that. But we're also the home to Prince. We've got Paisley Park here. We've got the Landscape Arboretum. We've got parks and trails and, and lakes that are to be envied by many. Um, and, and those are the big things, but it's the, the little things. The Andrew Peterson Farm, that's a farm that's uh, 200 years old. Uh, that is kind of run down that we have to say, are we going to invest in this or are we not going to invest in this? It's uh, dedicating a road called uh, farmer's road so that um, in the seventies we had 600 uh, cow farms and, and now we only have 35. And so a lot of those pieces of land are being gobbled up uh, by development and how do we honor the history of those farmers? And so I'm going to talk about the role of government. Um, I, I have this, I share this slide regularly. We'll move to that in a second. Um, a solve-based leadership is a foundation for how we can plug into this and deliver on the why. And then I'll get some housing there, neighboring well in third places. Next slide, please. So I like to share this because it seems like politically people are on one spectrum or the other, at least we, people would like it to lead the, uh, us to believe that way. Um, we either believe that the individual is responsible for whatever we're happening in our communities. One person needs to gather people together and make this happen and bring a bunch of people together. 
Um, or there's a top heavy view that believes that it's government's role to do everything. Um, just lean on the government. And so I like to put this slide up because people have to decide where they're at on the spectrum. And sometimes in their words and their actions, we know, um, but we never really state it sometimes. And so this is a pretty simple slide to say in our world, uh, the ultimate would be is, is if an individual can be self-sustaining and be able to create places and have a level of security, maybe that's based in a higher power, God or otherwise, um, and then the, the next step is friends, family, and neighbors. Those are considered natural supports in Carver County. And we want to we want to be able to create places and spaces uh, so that people foster those relationships in a way um, that are probably the most effective, impactful. Um, and then the next group is expanded supports. It's our churches, our not-for-profit civic organizations, our employers. It's not-for-profit funding. It's arts consortiums. It's all those things that are creating spaces and places close and in our community. And then I always say sometimes maybe uh, uh, careful what you ask for the, the last uh, kind of the last group is government. Sometimes it's quicksand is uh, it's the last last resort. It may be the furthest away from friends and family. Uh, there's a lot of hardworking people that live in and outside of our community. But when somebody's needs get to the government level, um, I think maybe sometimes it's even better to be support otherwise. And so you see the arrows on the bottom. Uh, sometimes it's financial support, sometimes it's emotional support, which we're seeing through COVID-19 and other things. Um, but really, what's the role of government? And then when I ran for election, a, a larger piece of the role of county government is physical infrastructure. It's the things that you drive on, the things that the roads, the bridges, um, clearing them, maintaining them, building them. That's the bulk of the dollars. But I think sometimes people forget about the social infrastructure. It's those relationships. It's those gathering places. That's where community is made. And, and you can see the strength of a community based on how they have invested intentionally or not in the social infrastructure. And any individual could be at any one of those stages at any given time. Um, but we really want to avoid that last kind of gray area. It's the folks that are hopeless. And so we're hoping that these spaces and places create a place of hope. We're hoping the government plays a role in that. And what is that role? We're hoping that those expanded supports take on a lot of that burden and, and help um, um, create that culture of what we want. And then uh, the natural uh, inclination is that friends, family, and neighbors can create those things. We'll go to the next slide. So what I talk about a lot within the boardroom and my peers, um, I'm the newest commissioner. The next uh, next person in, in line from age-wise is 16 years older. So I approach things in a little bit different way. Again, half my mind is marketing, half my mind is finance. Um, but one of the things I get uh, frustrated with is sometimes we always as government work on things and we're working on them so hard and diligently and passionately, we forget about trying to figure out what is the solve. And so spaces, sometimes we're always working on them. What is the ultimate? And so when I, when I talk about how do we, how do we approach something from a solve perspective, I'll use an example in a minute, simply working on something, there really isn't an end. It's just working and working and working on it. Sometimes that creates an unnecessary redundancy and overlap, maybe even a competitive nature. If I think about it from food and food security, there's so many organizations working on it because they all have their own piece of the pie. And then working on simply means good enough, like we're, we're doing good enough as to where we're at. And so what I've challenged our board from a leadership perspective is to say, let's look at things through a solve uh, lens, whether it's placemaking, whether it's libraries, whether it's uh, planning or economic development, let's look at what the goal line is. Let's look at what our shared alignment and efficiencies are, whether it's interactions with the unions um, representing uh, some of our workforce, whether it's our community leaders or otherwise. And a solve mentality says, how can we be even better? And so solve based leadership, if I use the example of homelessness, and this is one that's actually happened in the last year and a half since I've been in office. When I came in, I think a lot of times we were talking about, at least in Carver County, there's 250 people homeless any given night. And some people are kind of appalled at that is, wait a minute, how are you the most affluent county in the state and you still have homelessness? And some people would say, well, we're working really hard on it and we got these vouchers and we've got all these different things. And, and if you just gave me a million dollars, I'll tell you exactly how I'd spend it. The paradigm shift is, well, wait a minute, what, what are, what's inherent within those 250 homeless people? What is causing that? I think hopelessness is a little piece of that. And so we kind of looked at the math and we said, well, if we want to provide a place for everybody to, to be, uh, even the ones that live in the shadows of life, which are probably the hardest, what does that formula look like in a solve mentality? And so we've drawn a line in the sand that says we want to have enough affordable housing for at least 5% of our, our folks to be at or below $1,500 a month. And there's no uh, housing stock available in our community right now at that. And so to achieve that in 25 years, the framing of that would be 70 units per year for the next 25 years. 
So going from, well, we're never going to solve it. We just got to keep working on it. So wait a minute, it's only 70 units a year. It just changes the complexion of the conversation in my mind and others' minds to be like, wait a minute, if we, if we only need 70 incremental units a year and we've got eight major cities in our community, that only means that that means that every eight years, each one of those communities is committing to building a 70 unit complex. And so I, I share that as an illustration, not just for the uh, illustration of homelessness or some of the dire needs within our communities, but to say, instead of just working on something, what's the flip in the energy of being part of the solve of something big and major within our communities? Next slide. Oops. Sorry about that, I'll pull it right up. That's okay. You have about five minutes. Yeah. Yep. So one of the anecdotes I, I often say is 95 and a half percent of the time, the answer is just simply neighboring well. And when I was talking about um, when George Floyd events were going on and other hot topic social issues, they seem to, um, to get a boiling point in an election cycle. I said, my solution is simply neighboring well. It's personal, it's practical, and it's a how, there's an on-ramp. And it simply says, I value you and I love you even more than if I like you or I like the sign in your yard or the flag that you're waving or the car that you're driving. Um, the value of community says that the concern, currency of unity is more than the concern, currency of division. And my value stack may be different than your value stack, but I like I, I value the community just this much more. Uh, and then neighboring well means interrupting an I want and you should mentality. I think everybody on the call can maybe point to an instance or a community that says, I want this and you should deliver it as government or you should deliver it as the arts consortium. And so we need to interrupt that to have a we will mentality. And three practical ways that we're doing it in Carver County is to create on ramps. When people say, I just don't know how to get plugged in, we should have answers for those. And our three answers here are, just take five minutes a day to neighbor well. It could be a wave. It could be stopping over with a, a double batch of your cookies to give to the neighbors. And then every month, double that. So then the following month, it's 10 minutes or more. These are practical things to create those spaces and places uh, to be part of placemaking. The second one is make room for eight. So you see the graphic of the dice with the home in the middle. Look at the eight houses around you and make an intention, make, make room in your schedule over the course of the next month to reach out to them and neighbor well. I think sometimes we get fallen in the trap of COVID-19 um, has put us in our houses and we need to reinitiate those conversations at a local level. And then the last one is get stuck. I use the six six uh, dice, uh, six dot dice to say, try six times. And if somebody's not receptive after six, move on to the next. Next slide. Uh, and then the last thing is, is the third places. I like to talk about this a lot because uh, if we talk about the third places, um, it really opens it up to a broader discussion and dialogue. Uh, the first place, if, if this is new language to folks listening, is typically your home. The second place is typically your place of employment and those lines are getting blurred. But the third place is those places that we, we gather and we have to be intentional about those. So we're in the midst of potentially having three new libraries in our county in the next 10 years, which is crazy. And the questions that I ask in those conversations, are those li libraries gonna have full commercial kitchens? And people look at me like I have five eyes. Uh, I think it's the right question to ask because it's not just books in a box, it's a place for people to gather. Um, the next question I ask is when there's bike shops that come to town, um, is do they, will they be serving coffee there? Again, another place uh, to, to be and, and press people with the mentality. Should churches have daycares uh, where the older generation or middle generation is mixing with the new generation? The last question I tend to ask is should senior living areas have playgrounds so that the uh, folks that are getting up in age can interact and view and, and, and be given hope and enjoyment uh, to be intergenerational? And then ultimately at the end of the day, I think I got 30 seconds left is, are we spending more time on relationships than transactions? And I think a lot of the examples that were given before, and I'm sure will ha happen after with the pictures and the efforts, it's because the relationship was more valuable than the transaction. And I think COVID-19 has made us really, really, really good on transactions, but I hope that we're not leaving the relationships behind because at the end of the day, placemaking is about people. So thank you, appreciate it. Thank you, Matt. That was awesome. Thanks for giving a, a different perspective to the subject. Uh, we really appreciate that. Uh, we we're also hoping today to have on uh, folks from the Cuyuna Range to talk about their mountain, mountain bike trail system up there and, and how that's created a unique sense of place and a destination for uh, mountain bikers from all over the world. And uh, they've, they've added 20 new businesses there 
um, based on that. So we weren't solely looking at art when we when we originally set this up. So I appreciate that. Uh, so next up, um, we're going to have Kristen Allen uh, from New London talk. All right. Um, okay, so I am going to come at this, I think, uh, differently than everybody else because I am not a professional um, arts organizer, or I've, I don't have, I don't come at my work, my current work, at, as you know, having a long life. Uh, I come at it as an accidental creative placemaker, and uh, I found my story is that I spent my career as a, a graphic designer and product designer. And I worked, I always commuted. So I always lived in the New London Spicer area. Um, and so I've always been here, but I've had to work elsewhere. Um, and I felt very disconnected from the community that I live in. And so when my job in 2009 um, kind of went to a contract position, I was able to work from home all the time. And I realized I was sitting in my house, not connected to my community. Um, and so uh, I found that there was a, an old um, service station that I'm sitting in right now uh, that I purchased for my art a studio and my design office and it has a huge service bay that I thought ha that that's how I'm going to connect with my community um so uh in 2011 we made the purchase and uh my husband and I remodeled the whole thing um and made it mostly white mostly bland colors because I thought whatever inhabits the space will bring the color so um that's how I got to New London and since then, I've become a, Sam, a Simon Sinek fan also, Matt. And my why is that I believe that the process of making art is magical and transformative. And that when we share the same work table, uh, art making has the power to build community. And so I feel like what I'm doing is trying to live out that belief uh, in me and share that with my community. And I, I'm gonna share my screen here. Um, I call myself an accidental uh, creative placemaker because I uh, didn't even know there was such a thing, but a lot of the work that I do um, has been a truly accidental. Um, I, 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 don't, <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing, but I apparently have a superpower in that I know how to lower the threshold for art making of all kinds. And so that I just kind of have a sense about that, that if we need to do something as a community, I can figure out a way to bring people who have zero talent or, or interest even in making art and people who do it all the time and bring them together at the same work table. I just have a way of figuring that out. And so that is what I come to this work with. And so my story that I'm going to tell you is about the creative placemaking experience of New London that I know of, and then I'll just speak to a little of where we're going from here. So my overarching theme is that creative placemaking is hard, hard work, uh, but it's really worth it. And so uh, this is um, how we have kind of done it in New London. So this is... Uh, one of the ways that I started um, uh, involving my uh, garage with these kind of community uh, focused events. So we started, uh, uh, when I started meeting my community and reaching out and finding the other artists, I found, of course, if any of you know Bill Gossman, you know how easy he is to get to know. And then Craig Edwards also, two internationally renowned potters that lived in our community and really believed in our community. And so they, among others, would come and gather. And we had about seven or eight people that would sit on the couch in my um, uh, garage. And we just started dreaming together and talking and dreaming and talking, dreaming. And, and one of the members of our little group was the high school art teacher, who during one of our little gatherings 
said that, you know, for the last two years prior, she had had no funding to get her students to the Art Institute just to even see visual art um, uh, at that level. And so we thought we need to do something. We have to like rally the troops. We need to do this. And so our, our potters said that they would make ceramic bowls. Uh, I uh, offered to be the gallery, um, um, gallery owner. And uh, Carrie, the high school art teacher, ran her students through the experience of having an off-campus uh, gallery show. So we made them organize and curate their own work, uh, label it properly, mat it properly, present uh, their um, creative work. And then they had to dress up and then they had to stand by their art for like, uh, I think it was two and a half to three hours uh, and represent who they were as an artist, giving them the opportunity to communicate uh, who they were as an artist and, and the work that that expressed their voice. And so it was wonderful on so many levels. We invited the public to come in. Uh, we had a community uh, uh, organization, you know, come and help scoop ice cream. So we sold ice cream sundaes in these bowls for, for $20 a piece. And the, all the pottery was donated by our potters. And so then we created a fundraiser for the arts department. And so that was, that was an accidental solution to uh, a problem. Another thing that we did by accident while we were sitting around dreaming on a couch is uh, we had a hardware store. So this scenario in New London at the time was we had just lost our grocery store and we had just lost our hardware store a few years prior and they had been standing empty and it was, it was quite sad and it felt kind of like we felt kind of like it was sad <laughs> around here. And so we felt like maybe we could activate these spaces. And so because my uh, office spaces the wall that's being painted here in this image, um, I just kept staring at it thinking, um, we could do something with that. We could, we could do something. So we dreamt up a mural. And, but the difference with this mural is that we weren't gonna paint the mural the community was gonna paint the mural. And so it was done in, if anyone's familiar with how Chuck Close does his work, um, I basically did the computer back work to, um, to create an image that could be built square by square uh, by individual painters to make this mural uh, take up this space on that wall. And this is the Southern entry into our downtown area. So uh, we, Everybody can kind of uh, paint their square and given a, you know, a, a printout of, of the guidance. And they were given a paper plate with three tones of, of one color. So it was a monochromatic image. And then they were given an uh, eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper with their square. And they were told to paint what they see. And so they'd walk up to this uh, wall and get their corresponding square and they'd paint what they saw. And so that way, people of all ages, um, all skill levels could participate. And we left the grid, so we had taped off the grid, we left that grid in the work so that anybody could identify where their square was anytime in the future. When they came by to tell the family, hey, I painted that square. Oh, that's my square. Ah, you know, they, they belonged to that mural. And then um, we also felt the importance of building those connections with the contractors who painted down the wall, uh, did the repairs to the wall, painted it down. Uh, the, um, the vendor on the other side, he donated some paint. Uh, we had community members and the passing public. So tourists, anybody who was walking by could participate in this. And then uh, the thing about this mural is it doesn't stay. So we'd have the Boy Scouts, especially, they were especially tall one year. And so they came in and helped paint down the mural when it was at its uh, close. One of the key parts of our secret sauce was conversation. So we hosted conversation about what people felt was important and how they wanted to participate, you know, by, by offering their ideas, sharing ideas. And so one of the things are we, we formu 
formed the Arts Alliance around this couch of conversation. And so the New London Arts Alliance hosted Art Lux, where we had potlucks uh, talking about the arts. And so sometimes we would have someone exhibit some work, sometimes we would uh, do a curated conversation. Um, and we would have people of all kinds show up because, hey, it's potluck, what's the magic? Um, and then in, after those conversations started to occur, we, we got the uh, Art Place America grant. And uh, that gave us some structure to this accidental placemaking. And so Forecast Public Art came as part of that, uh, the way we we're gonna use our grant funds, we were gonna have Forecast Public Art come and teach our project leaders. And that would be random project leaders who had, who, they may have no art experience. They just have an interest in their, in their community. So they would have gone to probably one of those earlier conversations and said, you know what, I've got an idea I wanna, I wanna see happen. So Forecast came in and trained our river space project leaders. And we did a lot of ideation about what spaces, you know, in the community were the most important. And we decided to target this uh, alleyway that is kind of runs behind our, our main street and along the river. And it creates a really beautiful little walk space and, and place that really needed to be activated. And so through these training sessions, we would um, figure out what is needed, what do we need and what is possible within those needs and who are our partners and what are our resources. And so through this, we had to partner with the DNR, which ended up being, I think there, I don't know how many divisions of the DNR there are total, but we have four of them um, that we had as a, in a collective meeting to sell this idea. And one of the things, if you know about the DNR, working with the DNR, they're all about documents, documents and um, paperwork. And we had none of that. We, we were in the, uh, it, you know, uh, ideation stage. And so we had to sell them that on um, the idea that our community could be trusted to activate this space in meaningful uh, preservative ways. So meaning that we were going to use natural um, plants, we would take into consideration, you know, soil uh, uh, quality and, you know, um, what do I want to say, water, you know, how water would travel through the space and such. So it was really hard to do, but they gave us permission to work on land that was all theirs. So that was, that was a huge win for us. Um, one of the things that came from our uh, conversations and from this work with Forecast is that we needed to know or, or have kind of a guiding uh, structure for how are these projects going to be developed. And uh, New London's distinctiveness, as it is in the creative placemaking uh, kind of uh, thinking, is we, um, we are unique because of our history with the mill and other elements. Our natural environment, our, our city is uh, surrounded by ponds uh, and rivers and our community as it is today is another, and who are we? Like, who are we today? You know, um, because we were all already thinking about who we have been, but who are we today? And how can we be meaningful for economic development for kids coming back to, to live here for everyone seeing this as a great place to live? Um, so as we progressed through uh, the development of these uh, projects, which were the project leaders would then uh, make real their projects. And so on the top left is a, one of the project teams. Their view, vision was that we had a space in, in this alleyway that would be perfect for like a, they called it a, a piazza. And so they were going to Put the millstone, the historic millstone that was just degrading off in the back uh, of an alley, they were going to put that in the center and then make a place where people could have lunch, they could hang out, and then they'd, they'd plant the surrounding with uh, natural plants, and they'd have the combination of history, nature, and storytelling. About a minute to wrap up, Kristen. Here I go. 
Um, then uh, we also found that activating public spaces gave opportunities to artists and also unique experiences for the rest of the community. Um, we also kept changing and changing and animating public spaces over and over again. So this is a, a, a show of like the six murals that have been on the wall so far. The other thing that was important was to encourage other artists to shine. So we've had artists, uh, literary artists, uh, sculptural artists, storytelling, writers, and uh, artists that didn't think they were artists. Uh, we also built uh, partnerships and connections through these projects because we believe that local artists help to tell the story of a place. And then in the end, we always like to ask for feedback. And we feel that people who participate in public art uh, belong to that public art and it creates respect for those spaces and better for public safety. So that's my story told as fast as I could tell it. Awesome, Kristen, thank you so much. You know, I think your term accidental success, another, another uh, phrase for that is uh, good instincts. So, uh, <laughs> okay, next up we have Michelle Anderson from the Fergus Falls community. So Michelle, you've got 15 minutes. Hi everybody, uh, what a great way to spend um, part of today. It's been just really inspiring hearing all these examples and, connecting in this way. Um, it's kind of hard to be the last presenter, but um, because I, it makes me want to comment on everything I've seen. Um, so I'll try to stay focused. But uh, one thing that um, I'm hoping to offer today is that despite, um, you know, the, this huge range of placemaking examples that you've all seen, um, I know it can feel overwhelming to know where to start. And so um, it just happens to be that I'm going to share a little bit more about um, how to start conversations about placemaking in your community. Um, so that'll be the focus today. And hopefully that can kind of leave you um, with some ideas for steps if you're if you're ready to um, approach this work. So um, I work for Springboard for the Arts. Uh, we are based both in St. Paul and in Fergus Falls, Minnesota. <clears throat> and we have a, a wide range of, of offerings um, that meet this mission, which is to support, in, support artists with the tools to make a living and a life and to build just and equitable communities full of meaning, joy, and connection. Um, that illustration on the right are our three uh, priorities um, when we look at our work. Um, the core belief that we approach everything with is that artists are essential to, um, to strong communities and that when they have what they need to make a living in a life and when they're included and at the table in big conversations around all kinds of issues, that we can get to more vibrant and just local economies. And from there, um, that some of the systems that have um, not served everyone um, equitably, we, we can find more human-centered ways to um, create systems that work better for everyone. Um, you can read more about that on our website. We go into more detail in there. But um, another thing that we like to um, always share is that we have a pretty broad definition of what art is. And I think you saw that in all of the presentations today, um, but we love this quote by Alan Capro um, who said, art is a weaving of meaning making activity with any or all parts of our lives. And so you saw in our mission that um, the reason we do this work is that artists um, help us make meaning of um, all kinds of, of aspects of community life, of our personal lives, families. Um, and so that's um, why we, we know and believe that artists are so essential to um, society. Uh, you heard a lot of different definitions of creative placemaking. I, I just thought I'd offer the one that we like um, to use. We do a lot of placemaking presentations and workshops, so it can help to kind of have a little bit of shared meaning around what it what it is. Um, we define placemaking at Springboard as the act of people coming together to change overlooked and undervalued public and shared spaces into welcoming places where community gathers, supports one another, and thrives. 
Uh, and then places can be animated and enhanced by elements that encourage human interaction from temporary activities such as performances and chalked poetry to permanent installations such as landscaping and unique art. So um, I, highlight, I would highlight there the importance of human interaction um, in a good placemaking project. It's not just, um, you know, there's, there's room in the world and it's important to have public art that is, is there just for aesthetics and beauty, um, but placemaking is really about fostering that interaction and relationship building. And then the scale of placemaking can be anything from chalked poetry that any of us could leave this webinar and go do some placemaking right outside our doors um, to more permanent things, um, such as the bike trail in Lanesboro um, and so many of the other examples you saw today. Um, so I wanted to share today, uh, so like I said, Springboard does a lot of um, art and community development work um, we have helped a number of different organizations throughout the entire state um, get artists involved with local issues. Um, with the time I had today, I thought I would share, um, a, just kind of zoom in a little more to Springboard's lots of little approach that we use when we um, are helping um, a community or even responding to something in, in our local um, communities where we are based. So our lots of little approach is this idea that um, that an issue or a challenge can, um, that there's not one sweeping solution to uh, a, a big community issue, such as a vacant building or um, a pandemic or, um, or uh, revitalizing downtown. And so we believe that before you can come up with um, the more kind of permanent and, um, and kind of infrastructure uh, responses to those issues that it's really powerful to spend some time inviting the community into that conversation, not by not by sharing and brainstorming, which has value, but actually by doing things and demonstrating what they want to see and what they want to try. So our lots of a little approach has um, a, a few stages and um, we and I'll share how this looks in a few examples today. Um, but we we work with communities or partners to identify a common cause or an opportunity that they then want to gather artists around um, and uh, dive deep into conversation and visioning about how the arts might be able to respond to that community. Um, and from that initial conversation, we then um, work with our community partners to invite uh, as many proposals as possible from for very small projects that artists lead uh, responding to that issue. And by small, I'm talking like $500 to $1,000 um, per project. And then um, in this lots of a little approach, the idea is to fund as many of those projects as possible. Um, the kind of critical mass is to do five to 10 so that you can see a lot of different uh, artistic and placemaking responses to an issue. Um, but even up to 20, 30, um, depending on uh, the time frame and the budget that you have. Um, what this does is, is kind of what I'll, I'll walk through today, but um, the, the kind of high level, goal is really for learning and demonstrating what's possible in your community and then also relationship building just by um, giving people a chance to to try and demonstrate what they want to see in their community. Um, before I talk about the examples, we have some core principles that guide this model. So um, like I said earlier, we define artists very broadly. <laughs> so um, you know, they're traditional painters or poets or musicians, but also carpenters or culinary artists, um, gardeners. So um, it's, it, that can, uh, you know, often the most creative people in your community don't necessarily identify as a capital A artist. Um, and that can be kind of a alienating term, um, depending on where you're using it. So we, we often don't even use the word artist when we're uh, looking for all the creatives to participate in a program like this. Uh, working from existing assets, uh, which is something that we work with the artists on and in our initial kind of creative placemaking workshop. Um, we have some fun activities that I can't really talk about today with the time I have, but just for kind of appreciating, appreciating what already exists in a community and building off of what's there instead of what's missing. Um, collaborating across sector, so making sure artists have a chance to learn about 
uh, the different issues in their community and meet people from those sectors uh, so that they there's a face to um, this, these long-term planning and, um, and identifying challenges. Um, you know, so it might be a city hall person, it might be a public art or a public health director, um, giving people a common cause, which you'll see in the next few examples, providing simple mechanisms. So um, when looking for artists to uh, participate in a placemaking project, making it simple for them to propose an idea, not having um, uh, real, you know, complicated um, bureaucratic questions, but just um, even making it possible to meet with them if they're proposing an idea rather than writing it down building lasting relationships, and then ob obviously paying artists for their labor and their time. Um, so I have three examples uh, of how we have used this lots of little approach. <laughs> um, one is a project we did in Fergus Falls called the Year of Clay. And um, back to those core principles where I said, you know, um, it's important to address a common cause. The common cause for this project, the Year of Play, was addressing this doom and gloom narrative that was um, really hovering over the town um, be, that was the result of a number of retail closures that we really had no control over. Um, big box stores like Target and Herbergers um, caused conversations like this that you see on the right, <laughs> um, just very negative perceptions of who we are uh, and what, what our future looks like. But also there was some long range downtown um, master planning that was happening um, that, that was really important work, but it was sort of invisible to your everyday person that there was some you know, real um, deep work happening to make downtown a more welcoming place. So what we did was that through that lots of little approach, we invited, we gathered artists for an afternoon to talk about how we could make Fergus Falls more um, joyful and playful and build on the assets we have um, to explore uh, to explore what's possible for our future. Um, we invited artists to propose projects of just um, $500 each in this case, so we had a smaller budget to work with. Um, and the result was um, uh, around 20 different projects that happened over this year that we kind of um, branded as the year of play where artists did everything from um, pop-up parks next to the river um, that lasted all summer and just made this space that kind of reoriented people to appreciate the river. Um, something that in Fergus Falls has really, the community has really kind of built with its back to the river. So um, there's been a lot of long-term efforts to try to um, re-engage people with that space and think of think beyond the parking lot next to the river. Down on the bottom there, um, one of the artists that came to our workshop decided to um, try um, having Fergus Falls' first ever drag show. And um, so he used his $500 to organize a drag show um, in a community that's quite conservative and where the LGBTQ population really, you know, doesn't have a lot of safe spaces where um, they can celebrate who they are. Um, those drag shows have become a foundation in the community. There's now several every single year. So this, um, this is these um, supporting people to just try something for the first time often helps them see what will work and um, gets them other people on board to support it in the long term. Um, and down on the bottom, there was a um, a young father who. Um, had heard a lot of big conversations about how the community could start a splash pad. And it was a strangely divisive topic, um, but he decided to do a pop-up splash pad using PVC pipes and tarp and hoses just to show kind of the public that yes, there are families that would show up to something like this if we had it. Uh, so those are some of um, those examples. Um, with our hinge, uh, arts residency, we have taken a similar approach to facilitate conversations about the future of the Fergus Falls State Hospital and to provide kind of a, a way to reimagine this historic building and um, provide a space for community input on what is possible with that. Um, again, some of the small projects that came out of that were everything from performances that explored mental health and wellness, which um, is obviously a big part of the history of that building, um, to be using the building as public space for outdoor uh, movies, 
uh, theater or installations. Um, and all of these, again, were um, from that lots of little invitation of um, $1,000 projects for the most part. Um, and then we also have a program where we've taken this lots of little approach to other communities throughout Minnesota. So we have a partnership with Rethos Places Reimagined called Artists on Main Street. And um, this focuses on the idea of um, that downtown is for everyone and how to um, engage artists in activating overlooked and underutilized spaces in um, downtowns throughout Minnesota. Uh, so once again, uh, you know, it's just a, um, an incredible way to build individual agency and give people a chance to show what they can do as individuals and what they want to see. I won't talk about every single one of these, but you can just kind of see the, the very variations that the different ways people approach this invitation to think about downtown. Um, so there's about a minute art. left, Michelle. Okay, public art, um, pop-up installations and so forth. Um, some of the impact we see is this idea of supporting individual agency, giving people a chance to speak up and share um, that's, different than a survey or an open house. Um, we see projects that acknowledge and repair historic harms or address marginalization, um, changing the narrative of the community, building social capital, building resilience and capacity for the community to respond and um, increasing visibility and prosperity, uh, economic visibility and prosperity. And then of course, artist entrepreneurship. So many of these artists show what they can do and then get hired um, or they you know are able to use the success of their project to leverage other funds for their work. Um, so hopefully those give you some ideas. We um, we have a lot of resources um, to yeah um, try this kind of model in your community. So I encourage you to reach out to me if you have questions. So thank you all. Thank you so much, Michelle. I'm sorry my dog's singing in the background for us. So um, we, uh, we really appreciate all the information shared. Um, there's still time to answer questions in your chat box or Q&A. And Sarah Carlson, my uh, very able peer in Wilmer, will be uh, putting those forth to our panelists. So thank you again. I want to echo our thanks to all of our panelists. I was writing fast and furious, couldn't keep up with all of the ideas. So I too will be watching the replay of this webinar so that I can capture everything and huddle up with um, what we call artistic instigators in our area um, to see what we can bring forward. So I have a couple of questions um, and I tried to target one to each of our presenters. So I'm gonna start with a question to Heather and that is, um, Heather, do you have any tips for how to find funding sources that would help support public art projects if you're struggling to get something off the ground? Sure. Um, I the the first place I would send anyone, especially inside Minnesota, is to your local regional arts council. So no matter where you are in the state of Minnesota, you live within the bounds of a regional arts council, um, and then you also have access to the Minnesota State Arts Board funds. So there are um, two levels of support that that are funded by way of taxpayer dollars. Um, that you can access. And then um, panels like the community, or excuse me, foundations like the Community Foundation here in St. Cloud um, often have their own, you know, focused and targeted arts programming as well. The Minnesota Council for Nonprofits has a fantastic um, grants guide for all variety of opportunities. And also Springboard for the Arts is a preeminent resource for finding uh, places to connect with grants. Um, and so, you know, I'm biased, but of course, I'm always going to say check your regional arts council first. That's nice because you're um, competing with a little bit of a smaller pool because it's a localized organization. Thank you. One thing um, I would also add is that our sister foundation, the Central Minnesota Community Foundation and the Wilmer Area Community Foundation have foundation information network centers that are free for people to use and come do grant making searches that are local, regional, national funders who might have interest in the project. And you can search by keyword geography or uh, by a specific funder. 
And so if you are interested in making an appointment to come and see us and do that search, um, you can contact us at either of those organizations and we would be happy to help you. Thanks, Heather. My next question then, I'm gonna to go to Matt and I'm gonna ask Jennifer for her insights on this too. So we'll start with Matt and then go to Jennifer. And both of you talked um, about the need, how to successfully engage like municipal governments, chambers of commerce, um, those kinds of entities in place making, funding the arts efforts and way making. Um, how do you, what do you think made that successful or what tips would you have for communities who have not yet been successful in engaging their municipal and local government partners in this kind of strategic work. Matt? Well, I wrote one book. I'm in the midst of writing another one called Neighboring Well. And my next, my third book will be called Just Ask, The Answer May Surprise You. And I think that sometimes when you're in an elected role or you're in a position of influence or leadership, we may not always feel it in our day-to-day -day interactions, but some people perceive us as unapproachable. And so for me, it's being accessible in as many places and spaces as we can be to if somebody's going to ask you a question at a fish fry or a pork job dinner, or when you're out and about in the community to make yourself accessible. I write a column uh, once a month for a local newspaper. I think in the course of the last year and a half, I've gotten three people that have reached out to me that way. You go out in public, you're going to meet people. And so making yourself accessible and getting curious and having those reverse coffees. I think a lot of people ask us for 30 minutes Q and a coffee. Let's sit down and talk. I, I really want to pick your brain. I'm equally as intentional about picking the brains of people within our community. When you look at it, we have a community of about 108,000 people. The, the slice that I represent is about 22,000 people. Um, there's a finite amount of organizations within our community. We should be able to connect with those one-to-one -one during the course of an election cycle, I guess four years, if you will. And there's only probably 30 to 40 meaningful um, organizations. We should know the names of those leaders. Kai, um, I, I met Kai after we'd gone to the same church for 10 years. I met him in his role with the community foundation and not-for-profit that he runs. I was embarrassed when I did that because I didn't realize that a better society existed. I didn't realize the fund existed, but us as leaders we need to be intentional about doing the reverse interview to get out and have coffee with those folks. And sometimes those there's political barriers there, plow through them. You'll find some way to know each one of those organizations. Thank you. Jennifer, what would you suggest? Well, I think getting partners on board early is always, um, helpful and reaching out across, you know, whether for me it's something interdepartmentally, we're working on some public art projects with the water department. So it's getting to know all the folks in the water department and especially the um, engineers and whatnot who are doing the actual building. But out in the community, I find really um, from the bottom up is very helpful, um, whether you can make connections. I and mean, we have a wonderful neighborhood coalition organization here so it can get you in touch with at least 10 of our core neighborhoods along with others, um, nonprofit organizations, the library. There's a lot of really good community organizations to connect across you know, different uh, barriers. Um, and then, you know, once that community is established, it, it's much easier to go to elected officials because we already have the community support um, in our project. So I, I find that is really helpful as well as just giving my fellow city department people, you know, a heads up on this, this project that we're looking at for this space or whatnot. So it's, it's good communication, which, um, you know, isn't always easy, but, but it pays off in the long run. Sarah, let me offer one more thing in addition to what Jennifer said is um, we get a list once a month of people that are new to our community, whether they've moved on the block or they moved from outside the areas. And if you look at it collectively over the last year, there's a lot of people moving to our county that are from outside the county, even more so outside the state, people from California and Texas and Florida and Massachusetts, all these different things. And so just an invitation to say, here's what we're all about. Here's some places you can plug in for an on-ramp. That person's never going to pick up the phone and call you, but I've had many instances where they bump in and said, you're so-and-so. You put a picture with a face, you make yourself accessible. That active invite means a more robust community that's investing their thoughts and talents um, as the communities change. And we are changing rapidly. Um, so to invite those people to the table, it, sometimes it just takes an invite. Join me Friday for a fish fry. Would you consider grabbing a beer at the local whatever? Would you go to this art event that might be a little uncomfortable? But when you get an invite, people say yes when you get that personal invite. Thank you both. 
My next question is uh, to Kristen and to Kara. And um, those two questions really are about how do we uh, support or what do you wish we knew about how to support and engage those accidental placemakers to borrow Kristen's term? And then how do you help uh, position your community, Kara, uh, as marketing is particularly to get people to come to your community because of the arts and wayfinding work that you've got going. So let's go with Kristen first and then we'll go to Kara. Boy, um, open-mindedness is a huge value um, and listening and sharing. Um, did you ask me about organizational support or individual support? I'm Maybe sorry. both. Oh, both? Okay. Well, that's the individual one. Uh, organizational support, again, open-mindedness. And um, gosh, trust. And uh, yeah, trust is a big one. And I know that is earned. So, um, you know, that's um, the other thing I, I feel and, and this is what I felt about Our Place America when we went through, we got the grant from them. Uh, we could have used, because we were a rural little town, um, our arc to, uh, you know, from idea to implementation was quite short. And um, so it was, it was hard to get like the real principles of, of creative placemaking that were kind of their guiding uh, purpose for the grant. It was hard to, uh, to get meaningful tools to be able to share that information more broadly. And I think that's one of our learnings from that, that um, project was that I don't know that we have lasting uh, creative placemaking sensibilities within our community now. Um, and that's what I worry about. I feel like I'm singing an old song and, and uh, not everybody has the, the book with the lyrics <laughs> so yeah so information and tools for community thank you and Kara about marketing and making your place a destination yeah I mean that's a big conversation to tackle um, we do have a tourism um, chamber that helps with a lot of that but um, at Lanesboro Arts I think a lot of what we do um, that I talked about is partnering with the city on new initiatives and we try and do that each year and connect with um, the city um, every few months just to see what we can support. Um, one of those initiatives this year is helping with welcome banners. We have an artist that designed welcome banners that really highlight those assets that I talked about earlier, the river, um, music, the theaters, um, the historic dam we have in town. Um, and that's like a way to highlight what's going on as a placemaking effort, but also is helping the city with the initiative that they have and using an artist to um, solve that um, problem that they have. Um, and I would just say like, so we just try and have new efforts going all the time um, with, with that collaboration with the city. So there's always something new to see here in Lanesboro and that's something that we promote. Um, yeah. Thank you, Cara. And my final question is to Michelle. And Michelle, so if your area does not have a cohesive local arts group. Do you have any suggestions for our listeners on, on where they should start to gather maybe some like-minded folks together with an idea that they're gonna do either some strategic doing or this lots of little style approach? Yeah, um, I love that question. I think um, one thing we believe at Springboard is that uh, creativity is a natural resource in every community. So even if you don't have the um, the kind of traditional infrastructure of like a theater and art gallery, chances are there are people making things um, in their homes or in the library. So um, I mentioned that when we do our lots of little approach, we we um, often don't even use the word artist. We and so I can actually. Put in the chat here if anyone wants to steal this language we have a phrase we kind of mix up every once in a while but it's it's generally like do you dance in the dark do you sing in a choir do you um, make mittens for your family then we want 
you to be part of this conversation. We're asking all creatives and makers um, to come and brainstorm about um, how creativity can address you know, X issue. Um, and we find that often the beginning of that workshop, um, people are really apologetic. They're like, well, I'm not an artist, but I thought I'd come here. By the end, they're like, I, I think I am an artist. And so we see more people also really owning that um, identity and then starting to be more, um, just be um, more upfront about it as they introduce themselves and what they have to offer in the community. So yeah, hopefully that answers your question. Thank you, Michelle. I want to also mention to those who are watching that if you go into the Q&A tab and into the chat feature, you're going to see a number of resources, including some really insightful questions and answers that have been supplied by our panelists while their peers were speaking. So if you have a moment, pop in there and take a look at some of those as well, because there's some great resources. Well, again, thank you to all of our panelists and for all of you making time. At this time, I'd like to introduce my colleague, Kai Tron, with the Carver County Community Foundation to, for our wrap up. Kai? Thanks, Sarah. First, we'd like to thank all of our speakers. I think uh, a lot of us have thanked them already, but uh, Jennifer, Heather, Cara, Matt, Christian, and Michelle, uh, thank you for your time today, your commitment to the community, your willingness to share your experiences today. Uh, just great work that's been done and continues to be done in our communities. Um, next, we'd like to uh, thank everyone for attending and for the work that each of you are doing in your own communities. Uh, we encourage everyone to find more resources for placemaking on our website, and uh, there's a lot of other resources as well. So please give us your feedback, comments, ideas, uh, and we will make sure that everyone gets that as well. As a reminder, our next webinar will be May 3rd. Um, professional advisors will be talking about alternate, alternative gift options like crypto and real estate. And then on June 16th, our next community connections session will be all about building community. So lastly, whether you're a panelist or an attendee, we all thought it was important to spend the last two hours together. And I would venture to guess it was all for the same reason. Uh, we all care about our community and we want to see it thrive and we want it, uh, we want it to become better for everyone. So thank you again, everybody, and uh, have a great rest of your day. <laughs>